right now on Higher Journeys with Alexis Brooks. Uh, as a child, I was always sensitive to the uh, vibrational frequencies that were around us. And uh, while I was taking the, the bath, uh, I felt a change in the vibrational frequency within the bathroom. I looked to my right and two beings appeared. They were slightly elevated off the floor, uh, both very attractive, both long blonde shoulder length hair, uh, wearing a tight fitting blue jump suit type uniform and they had deep blue eyes and as I said very attractive and they were talking to one another telepathically uh, which I could understand. The idea that human-looking ETs walking amongst us is not new to those who have immersed themselves in the rich, though still mysterious, history of our relationship with non-human intelligence. More people are coming forward to report their frequent interactions with these beings, yet even more, perhaps millions, are reluctant to speak about their own contact encounters. Lifelong contactee Kevin Briggs is not one of those individuals. Recalling his first encounter with beings whom he refers to as Ort and D at the age of eight, Kevin maintains that these two beings have been with him for nearly 60 years, and at their urging, his mission has been to share his experiences with the world in hopes that more people will come to understand that they, the beings, have and continue to be with us, especially through these turbulent times. Listen now as Kevin details his incredible journey alongside the ETs what they have taught him, and what they insist he now must share with the world. Kevin Briggs, I can say with all honesty right up front, you are a delight. This is the first time you and I have had occasion to speak, even though we we share quite a few mutual colleagues. We've been in touch via email for the last couple of years, and I just felt like it was time to bring you and your amazing story to our broader uh, Higher Journeys audience. So first and foremost, I just want to thank you for being here. You're welcome. No, thank you very much, uh, Alexis, for inviting me on your show. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. And without people like yourselves, I couldn't get my message out there. And I've been asked by my ET guys to share my message and share the information. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, it's our pleasure. Absolute our pleasure. And and I appreciate those kind words. But you know, as I move forward in my journey and learning more about this enigma, we call the contact phenomenon, it becomes increasingly urgent for me, Kevin, to make sure that voices like yours are heard, because there are many other voices, I'm convinced millions, maybe billions of voices that for whatever reason, don't feel the strength to come forward, at least at this time, to tell their story. So by you coming to the, to the surface of things, and you've been talking for a while, you're adding to the validity of the reality of not just contact, but relationship with what we call non-human intelligence. So please know how important your work is as well. Well, speaking of your work, your work and speaking about your experiences that do not have not occurred in a vacuum, we're talking 60, nearly 60 years you have been an experiencer and I'm noticing you just froze. I hope you unfreeze. Move so I can make sure you're <laughs> you're still with us. Yeah, I'm fine. There oh, you are. I know you're okay, uh, so you, yes. okay. Juniors, we have a little bit of a dicey connection because Kevin mentioned that he's kind of out outside of the uh, I, I think where it's really wired, your connection may not be as strong as uh, some others. So bear with us, but we just want to make sure we can get your message across. So anyway, as I was saying, we're talking lifelong experience or nearly 60 years at this point, right? I want to talk about That's several right. key, uh, key epiphanies I think you had uh, on this journey of your encounters. I want to start with when you were eight years old. And I think the best place to start is the beginning and you're telling our audience what happened. Eight years old, you're in your bathroom doing whatever you're doing and what happened? Okay, yes, I was, you're correct, I was eight years old. Uh, as a child, I was always sensitive to the uh, vibrational frequencies that were around us. And uh, while I was taking the, the bath, uh, I felt a change in the vibrational frequency within the bathroom. I looked to my right, and two beings appeared. They were slightly elevated off the floor, uh, both very attractive, 
both long blonde shoulder length hair, uh, wearing a tight fitting blue jump suit type uniform, and they had deep blue eyes, and I said very attractive, and they were talking to one another telepathically, uh, which I could understand. I was terrified, as you can imagine, being an eight-year-old and two beings materialized in your bathroom. Uh, and as I say, they were speaking telepathically to one another, and they were speaking about me, not to me. And I remember um, the uh, female, her name is Dee. Uh, I know them very well now. I've known them for 60 years. And Art, the male, uh, and Dee uh, questioned uh, Art and said, is this the boy? And he Art said, yes, this is a boy. And then she said, uh, are you sure this is a boy? And he said, yes, this is a boy, I'm sure. And, and then she again questioned him and said, well, look at him. He's, he's frightened by our presence. He's small. He's uneducated. And uh, he said, yes, this is a boy. I will guide him. I will teach him. There was some other conversation in there. Uh, and then they left. And I was, as I say, I was frightened to death. I didn't get out of the bath. The water went cold. It was shivering. Uh, my mother came in to see uh, why I was still in the bath and the water was cold. And I explained to her about the two beings and she said it was just my imagination. Uh, and it wasn't. Uh, I'm now in, still in contact with them to this day, 60 years later nearly, and uh, and uh, contact with others that they introduced me to when I was 14. So uh, uh, that was my first encounter of Art and D. So. Art and D. Yeah. O T T. Uh, o R T Art, Art and D is just D E E. Okay, I recall you bringing that up in uh, some information I sent. Well, listen, or that you sent to me. I want to play a clip for you, uh, Kevin, that might ring familiar to you, journeyers. You may have heard it before. This is an account that came from Richard Dolan when I interviewed him back in 2015. You take a listen to this, and let's have a little bit of commentary on the back end. Watch this. I was at a different conference in Western Pennsylvania, so really the other side of the country. Uh, <clears throat> this was in 2010. It was right after my book, A.D., After Disclosure, came mm -hmm. out, and I remember it very well. I had, it was the first time I had those books at an event. And I'm sitting at my table, and this woman and her husband come up to my table. And this, this woman was uh, about 60 years old at the time. She looked like, you know, like a nice housewife, honestly. And her husband looked like a nice regular guy who, I don't know what his job was, but they were just good people. You'd probably be happy to have them as your neighbor. Mm -hmm. She said, well, I had a really strange thing happen to me back in 1965, and I wonder if I could tell you about it. And I said, yes, of course. I mean, I, I, this happens to me all the time when I'm at a conference. People sure. tell me these strange things. <laughs> so... um she said, well, it was 1965, I was about 15 years old, and um, I was in church with my mother here in western Pennsylvania in a tiny little town, and there's lots of tiny little towns in western PA, I've been there many times. Um, she said, where everyone in town knew everybody else, especially in church. So she's with her mother in church, and uh, she sits down in the pew, and right in front of her, this absolutely beautiful blonde couple sits in front of her and she said these she said you have to understand these people were not just attractive they were like beyond attractive they were like the most unbelievable supermodels mm -hmm. you could imagine and she said and their clothing was the most impeccable fine blue fabric i've ever seen in my whole life here like, we go never, with blue again yeah exactly right. <laughs> exactly wow and uh, being a teenage girl um she didn't say this but i assume i have a teenage girl uh, very knowledgeable about fashion, very interested in that sort of thing. So I think she was just transfixed sure. by this couple, like staring at them. And she said, and what amazed me was how like nobody else was looking at these people. It's as if they were just in there and, and they were like, the most obvious thing in this whole church was this blue couple, <laughs> this blue dressed <laughs> blonde couple that looked amazing. And why was I the only one noticing them? I didn't get that. So while she's saying, and she's watching them too, and like they obviously did not fit in. Like they didn't, it was a Catholic mass, and hmm. I grew up going to Catholic mass, and you know, you have to sit, kneel, you gesticulate, you do the sign of the cross, you do all of these things. And, and she said, like, I could tell they didn't know how to do it. Like they were looking around at everyone else and following along. This was like not something that they had grown up doing. Mm -hmm. 
And she said, as I was thinking this, I heard one of them thinking to the other. So again, and this is on the other side of the country. This woman had no idea who the colonel was. I, right. not, not a chance. She said, I heard them thinking to each other, and I heard one of them think to the other, well, it appears that we're fitting in pretty well here, or thoughts to that effect. And then she heard the other one thinking back, yes, except for the girl behind us who can hear us. Well, sir. Fascinating. Fascinating. There's, some, there's some glaring similarities in your stories. And believe me, I've heard others just recently, as a matter of fact, I interviewed a gentleman who talked about his own encounter with an exceedingly handsome blonde man that, uh, in which he had a very strange encounter. We won't go into that now, but the bottom line is when I heard your story, I immediately had to go into my archives and get that clip. I don't know if you've ever heard Richard Dolan talk about it. I believe I was the first one that he gave the story to years ago, <clears throat> but the bottom line is, We've got to be talking about similar entities. Give me your thoughts on what you heard, please. I, I would agree entirely. It's the first time I've heard that. Uh, but that description fits Orton D to a T. The way that uh, Richard said there in, in relation to uh, like more or less beyond beautiful, as it were, just unbelievably attractive, so attractive. just um, And that deep blue uh, clothing that they're wearing and the long blonde hair, it fits into a T. And I know others that have met with Orton D specifically now, uh, and I've got evidence of, well, hearsay evidence both from a third party, although from one uh, of them, I, I heard directly myself, she contacted me at a meeting when uh, I gave a copy of my book to give to uh, the person that was uh, uh, had arranged the meeting. And as she took hold of the book, she felt that she needed to open the book at the back. And she opened the book and there was a, a photograph or a sketch that my wife had done of Orton D. And she said, I've uh, I've met these couple. I've met, I know them. Uh, I need to speak to Kevin. And by that time I had left the meeting. Uh, she managed to get my email. We made a contact. And then uh, it turned out she be, she was a friend of a mutual friend of both of us, uh, Kathy Marden. So we all got together. We went down and had lunch and we compared our notes. And uh, we had confirmation that we were both speaking to Art and D. Uh, just amazing, really. It really is amazing. I mean, look, we don't want to spend too much time on the surface level of who, what are their names, who are they, where are they from. But I do want to touch on that and then go a little bit deeper as to why, what their motivation is in connecting with people like yourself and probably many others. Who, in your estimation, or what do you believe they represent who do they represent okay well I, I know that i can answer that from the information that they've given me they are part of a galactic council a galactic council of eight uh, and i've met uh, all eight of this council when i was 14 years old i was taken up to meet with them and uh, so they're part of that council they are here to help us uh, evolve into a higher conscious species uh, and help us develop it, a better society. They also want us to help uh, protect the earth. Uh, they're very concerned that we are destroying uh, our earth, the plants, the animals, uh, and we need to be able to uh, understand that and then hopefully take care of the planet because then the planet take care of us as a species. So they are here. They are benevolent. Uh, they've been here for many, many years, I'm sure. I know Art and Dee tell me they live up to 300 years uh, a piece and uh, another member of the council of eight he's anunnaki and he lives he's over five thousand years old he tells me so uh, uh, there are beings that live a lot longer than us but they're here to help assist with the evolution assist with our technologies uh, and as assist with the pollution of the planet which they can help us rectify and reverse what we've done over these past few hundred years really in relation to destroying the planet I'm trying to figure out which question I want to ask first as you're telling me this, <clears throat> excuse me, in the midst of going through the most, what I would describe as the most surreal and in some cases hellish experience of our human lifetimes right now. In the context, I'm just going to go there within the context of all that's going on right now. What, 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 what might they be suggesting? Are they give? I'm just going to go right to the heart of the matter. Are they giving any details about 
not just who's to blame, but what the heck is going on? What no, is they going haven't said anything about that at all. They don't lay any blame anywhere. They just want to assist. They want to educate us into an understanding of consciousness, shared consciousness, and how we're all connected to the plants, the animals, the insects. Uh, the planet itself is conscious. Uh, and then all the other galactic species and beings, we all share that one consciousness. And once we realize that, and then we can, uh, because of that education, we will treat our planet, our insects, our animals, our plants in a different light because we all share that one consciousness. And that's part of the education. And it's part of the message that they want me to share. And there are many now that I speak to who have an understanding of our shared consciousness. Uh, and it's growing exponentially now within our species. And uh, uh, that's the way our, our evolution will go. And it has to go like that because we're on a path of annihilation if we don't. Absolutely. But we, I see in the few years that I've been speaking out, there, and I've contacted with many groups, there are many groups working on this before I started speaking out. So we are in the, heading in the right direction. And my ET said that we're heading towards the golden years for humanity. And uh, I'm very confident in that. I'm very excited for the future. So from my perspective, it's very positive. Okay. Okay. I, I think it's probably a paradox. It's probably a bit of both. Uh, I'm not going to reiterate what I've said many times. You know, all the cliches apply. The darkness is before the dawn. We're clearly going through some rocky times. But my sense is that there is a, a golden dawn on the other side of this. We don't know what that interim period will be, however. That's, that's all I'm saying. I, I do feel that it has to be. We're, we're getting too much help here. We're getting too oh, much without, help. Without a doubt. And uh, I'm aware of other councils as well, although I'm not okay. in direct contact with them. I'm aware of a council of 12, uh, and they're working towards healing the planet itself and healing the ley lines, the energy lines of the Earth. And I've just been informed recently that that healing of the Earth has been completed now. And I know that's been done by... Uh, this group of 12 with their ambassadors down here who assisted in, in doing that, in achieving that. So, uh, But at this moment in time, they don't want me to mention who they are and, uh, and their mm -hmm. direct contract, but maybe in the future I will be able to speak about them as well. So, And I'm sure there are other councils as well. Uh, not unlike here on Earth, we have all the different governments, the different councils, they all work together. And I know when I uh, was asked to go and visit with the Council of Eight, and I was taken up into a mothership, into an amphitheater, and the Council of Eight was sat at the front on the in the amphitheater, and the the whole audience uh, were ambassadors uh, from the different councils. I'm sure um, mm -hmm. all there attending a meeting. I say when I was 14, I thought I was there as a specimen human, but uh, I realise now that wasn't the case. So as I say, I've been in touch with them all my life, but uh, um, yeah, just. Listen. Amazing. They are here to help. And there's many right. of them, not just my eight. There are many others as well. Many others. I would imagine there's a spectrum. I want to go back, Kevin, because there's so much, so many dimensions to your story, uh, pun, no pun intended. Uh, all of the details, what you have learned about from the experiences, what what intel you've received from uh, uh, this this group of individuals, particularly or tell me again, D and Ot, O R T, Ot. Ot, Ot. It's a very, yeah. kind of an awkward Ot. pronunciation. It, is D an, or. it, it might be my accent as well, Alexis. <laughs> Ort, or from, Ot. from the Boston area, Ot. Yes. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> names, names are not important. But look, I would really like to, let's, let's go back in time a little bit. I want you to just tell me, let's get into the personal implication or the emotional implication of when you discovered that you were in communication with non-human intelligence. This happened at a very young age. Did you have conscious recollection that, uh, that this was happening or was it later that you had the recollection that okay. this had happened? I, I, everything I had at the time was a conscious recollection. Okay. The, of everything apart from one event, and that was the event when I was fourteen. I uh, I was a. If I tell you the story quickly, uh, I had a paper round when I was fourteen, and uh, I would go out of the house, and as I walked out the house, a, a UFO would appear above the house. I would then uh, 
uh, walk from the house down to collect the papers at the paper store, and a second UFO would appear. And that UFO would always follow me around, uh, both of them. And uh, and I was aware that there were other beings, the other side of the hedge, the other side of the wall, they were there. And uh, I asked them uh, on one occasion, I plucked up courage uh, for them to show themselves. Uh, and they did. And that's when they took me up to uh, uh, the craft, to the mothership, to meet with um, the Council of Eight. Now, that's the only one that I di I knew something had happened uh, because I was aware of the ETs, I was aware of them following me, but the actual recollection, I, 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 I couldn't quite access that memory. So on one occasion, I got my friend Kathy Madden to hypnotize me, and then the whole story came out in relation to being taken up onto the craft and meeting with the Council of Eight. All the other recollections, elections i remember and i say i had an inkling of what had happened but i didn't have all the details uh, but i do now and i know that kathy madden recorded that and she's got a book coming out soon i don't know if she's going mm -hmm. to mention that in the book but all the other accounts that i speak about i have perfect recall i know who they are i know when i meet them i have uh, telepathic communication with them and there, there are many modalities of contact that they use and I, i've always found over the years uh, what i've done if they give me download or telepathic communication i always ask for confirmation they gave me uh, uh, an understanding of the quantum unified field theory in relation to in addition to it from what our scientists fully understand mm -hmm. uh, what they need to do is include consciousness within their own equations and un understanding of the quantum unified field theory and if they do that then they'll have a better understanding when they gave me that information as a download, I said, you've just given me this information. Can you uh, uh, show me a craft as confirmation that it's not my own thought and it, it's you? Uh, a craft appeared immediately. I went inside to get my wife to come outside and witness it. And then a second craft appeared, a third, fourth, fifth, seven in total <laughs> appeared, flew silently, silently over our heads, changed direction at 80 degrees, uh, and then moved off and disappeared sequentially as they had appeared so that was confirmation for me and i know they gave me another download uh, about the theory of everything uh, in relation to uh, again our scientists understanding but they there was a measurement problem in there uh, relating to space time and dimension and mm -hmm. they said if our scientists included consciousness within their calculations and equations it would solve that uh, space right. time dimension uh, problem and when they gave me that, I said, look, you've just given me all this information. I really need confirmation that it's not just my imagination. Can you show me a craft to confirm that information has come from you? A craft appeared and it flashed one, two, three times. Mm. Well, I've done that all my life, all the information that I've been given, and I get confirmation. And that way I'm able to repeat it comfortably, uh, confidently, because I have asked them for confirmation on each uh, right. communication whichever modality they're using whether it's dreams telepathic uh, physical materialization or whatever i always ask uh, for confirmation if you're enjoying this episode along with all of the subjects that we cover here on higher journeys then i invite you to join our members only community on patreon where we go even deeper into the conversations with the guests that you know and love not only does your membership ensure that we can keep this work going and growing, but you'll also get immediate access to our exclusive after shows. Get up close and personal with the guests of the show, along with many other member perks. So click on the link below to join now or visit higherjourneys.com where you'll find the Patreon link. We'll see you on the journey. Thanks. Right. Wow. You've given us a lot there. You a lot. I mean, each little nugget that you gave us, I could we could have a, a conversation on, particularly when it relate how it relates to your downloads of the unified field theory of quantum mechanics, etc. And I don't know that this may have to be a second show just on that, but I really, really want to focus on at least for the time being, the psychological impact that the realization you were having these experiences had on you. Did you have support from your family? Let's go, let's go back to, to childhood a little bit. As a matter of fact, I want to do this. I want to talk a little bit about the incident or the epiphany that you had at the age of three. It's subtle but profound. Tell the audience that story about when you had the photo session with your family at the age of three. What happened? Okay. Well, my mother had engaged a photographer to take some photographs for the family album. The uh, photographer, uh, Julie, arrived 
we'd been washed had a hair brush and i was to go first and the photographer lifted me up onto the oak dining room table uh, and from that position i looked around the room and uh, saw it from a different perspective but not only that only not that that the fact that uh, i realized that my conscious energy was in a physical being again and uh, that was my first recollection of being uh, me as it were in this physical you see now so um and i know when i told my wife that story she said that uh, three-year-olds don't use words like consciousness and three-year-olds certainly don't understand it well i did and i still do to this day it, it it's normal to me it's just my, my normal and uh, i know when i speak about this to others but i've met others now that you know they've had this understanding from the age of one two three i've even met one experiencer that remembers being in the womb and absolutely given, given information mm -hmm. so it's common it's common it's just that our culture doesn't allow us to speak out about it and now right. i think that's why they asked me a few years ago to speak out about it and right. see that others having confidence to speak out about it and uh, we're all joining forces now and it's becoming normal shall we say mm -hmm. to speak about these experiences and we're sharing that understanding of consciousness itself right right let's go back to three years old you had this epiphany of being aware or conscious of the fact that you were conscious in your body this body but conscious again let's stay on that for a little bit kevin what you're intimating is this idea that you have been here multiple times uh, yes I, I would say so that's my understanding that we uh we are um spiritual beings we are souls mm -hmm. and that the souls incarnate in the physical to gain experience and to learn i understand that uh, I have two previous recollections uh, of lives, or more, shall I say, deaths, because they were violent deaths, uh, and I think that's why I particularly remember them. Uh, one, I was a, uh, a knight Templar, and I was fighting at the Battle of Agincourt, and uh, an arrow came through my uh, armour, pierced my heart, directly in my heart, and I fell dead to the floor immediately. Uh, and I remember that death because it was violent. And then the, another one, it was uh, 1789 in the French Revolution. I was a royalist, a young boy of about 14. I was taken from my home on the back of a cat, uh, taken down to the Bastille, and the following morning, uh, beheaded, because I was obviously a royalist. And so I remember those. I remember them as a child. And when did I, you remember those? What, at what age did you remember those? Oh, what age? Oh, I'd be seven, eight. Uh, and I could access... I would go back and explore and access those lives. So I um, want to make a point. I want to try to connect some dots here. Bear with me, guys. Okay. Well, I'll go with it. <laughs> Interesting that you believe you recalled those very horrific uh, deaths around the same time that you met the beings in your bathroom. Let's connect some dots here, Kevin. Do you feel, have you had any idea that perhaps you were also in contact with non-human intelligence in previous incarnations. No, I, I have nothing uh, uh, about that at all. Nothing at all. Really? No. Okay. No, just from this incarnation, they have shown me my next incarnation, uh, which is quite interesting, but I have no memories of uh, contact with uh, non-human intelligence. It, and I've only got those two previous memories of previous lives, and I suspect because of the violent death. But I explored them as a child because I wanted to know that I wasn't certain whether they were dreams or realities, but I was able to access them uh, and I could go into them. And I remember the first time I went into the one with the uh, uh, when I was, had the guillotine come down and chop my head off, I woke up as the guillotine was coming down. And at school that day, I was thinking, now what happens? If I hadn't woken up and I'd have died in the, if I thought maybe a dream, would I die in the physical? So I thought the following night I'll I'll get I'll access that I'll go back into that time, and I, I went into that time and I was watching it unfold the story unfold as like a third party from the outside looking in, and it got to the point where the uh, head was chopped off and I wanted to know if you could see in the basket when you were your head fell off. <laughs> <laughs> a bit a bit ghoulish for a young child but uh, i found out that i could see for about four seconds uh, but it answered the question in relation to uh, whether it was a dream or a past life 
uh, in that particular dream, shall we say, uh, I didn't die. I didn't wake up at that time. I woke up in the morning. But it answered those questions for me. And I can still access that information now if I want to. I can relax, open my mind, and go back to that time and access it. How many individuals beside yourself, and I obviously don't expect a hard number, how common do you think the experiences, at least some of them that you're having, particularly with the Council of Eight, how common are they? Based I, think on what I think they're very common. I think that uh, uh, people, our culture doesn't allow us to speak out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, medical cultures don't allow us to speak out. They will put label on us. Uh, of mental illnesses, psychosis, all sorts of things. So uh, what's happening now, because I'm speaking out and someone can give exactly the same story, who I don't know, and then other people give the similar story, and we've all got a piece of the jigsaw. So, And then when you see the credibility of these people who are speaking out about this, it's becoming the norm. So we're, we're being educated, but we're being educated by one another. But we've been educated by the ETs or the higher conscious beings, uh, whatever label, star families, whatever label you want to put on, they are educating us to educate others. Um, I, think that, I think that's the, the goal. But then the, the, the goal is to edu educate humanity so we can rise to those higher levels of consciousness uh, and treat one another better, treat the planet better, uh, and have a better society for our children, our future generations. And, and we're part of that. We're here to assist and help with that evolution and development. I just received a private message in my members community from an individual who obviously I'm gonna keep anonymous about her own encounters I say broadly, non-human intelligence, along with her daughter, who she believes to be a star seed. Um, I'm not going to give too many details, but the, the gist of it is what I got is that it has not been a pleasant experience. It's been the opposite of what you're describing. It's been malevolent. And we can't know for sure what the motivations of these myriad species are. But let's assume that there are vast, there is a vast spectrum of experiences and how they are experienced. Why is it that some individuals that are experiencers are having extraordinary, positive, uh, growth-oriented experiences like you, and then there are these other stories? What's the X factor here? Well, I, my own personal opinion is, I think, like anything, there's good and the, there's evil, and there's uh, graduations of that, and and I'm sure there's some. Uh, uh, malevolent uh, beings as well as the, the, the good ones and uh, I've been protected by uh, the good beings and uh, I, I am aware that there's the evil side there I am aware of the bad ETs who want to disrupt things or want to maybe take over the planet and things like that but they're a minority I've been told they're a minority okay. uh, but have you been in contact with them have you have you ever had any brushes with the less uh Good ones, if you will. I, I had um, um, a reptilian come into my bedroom one evening, and just your typical reptilian. And uh, he came because he was curious. He wanted to know how a human being had the communication abilities I had with uh, all the different species. And I think that came about because I was actually traveling outside of my body on one occasion, which I do uh, a lot of the time, most of the time, really. And uh, um, I, I came into contact with a, a group of ET, two ETs who were transporting some minerals from the Earth to the moon. And I sort of materialized behind them in their cockpit. And they both looked uh, uh, back at me and said telepathically to one another, what's he doing here? And then I realized I shouldn't be there, so I apologized and I left. I went back home and uh, I woke up and then a, a gray being appeared in my bedroom, a tall gray being with a large head, and he told me uh, uh, that I wasn't to interfere. And uh, he, he, he came across as, as, a, as an official and warning me really not to interfere. And then it was shortly after that that this uh, reptilian appeared in my bedroom. He didn't speak to me, but I knew what he was thinking. And he, what he was thinking was he'd come to see how a, a small human being could have the capabilities of traveling outside of a body, uh, interacting with others and understanding telepathic communication. Uh, but I have heard of one story 
uh, where a reptilian uh, healed somebody and uh, uh, an amazing story so again there'll be the good reptilians and the bad reptilians it's like a, a yin and a yang and I'm, I'm fortunate in the respect that my ETs protect me i know the bad ets are there the evil is there uh, but i've never i've never accessed it i just leave it in the veins at one side and don't get involved well-known uh hypnotherapist as well and researcher barbara lamb has spoken about her interactions with what she would categorize as good reptilian beings again there's so many different uh sectors, layers, dimensions, literally and figuratively of these species as with us. So it certainly wouldn't surprise me that even within a species, there are subspecies or partitioned species, different kinds. So that being said, that's not hard for me to get my head around beyond the fact that it's still, you know, still Kevin to so many, certainly not our audience, but many that do, uh, that are now coming into this information are still just trying to grasp the idea that not only are we not alone but there is regular contact going on daily and many some that i have talked to who heretofore weren't even open to the idea of ufos are now having triggers of remembering their own contact encounters going from one extreme to another I have so many questions i want to ask you and i'm going to keep keep an eye on the clock because we we're not going to have too too much time left uh, on this portion of the show, we are, of course, going to the after show on Patreon. But I want to talk a little bit about, before we go, there's two things I really want to kind of focus on. One is in terms of, well, I'm not going to call the shadow being phenomenon a negative thing per se. It, it tends to have that connotation. But you have mentioned that you've had shadow being or shadow person encounters. Very, very common in my uh travels and talking to people that have can you tell us a little bit about that and how that connects if at all yes i can i i've seen shadow people uh, all my life and uh, uh, they just described to me as being uh, beings that live between dimensions uh, they're normally very mischievous they'll appear and you'll see them out the corner of your eye they'll dart behind the sofa and you'll look and they won't be there uh, and, and that's my uh, earliest recollection of them. I knew they were there, they didn't bother me, and uh, I had this uh, uh, definition of who they were uh, and what they were doing. But they're also used for uh, communication and connection between the ET beings. And on one occasion, I was, uh, I was come home from work, I was a police officer in the UK, and uh, I'd uh, done one shift till 10 o'clock at night, then I got up at five in the morning to do another shift. And when I came home from those quick changeovers, I would usually go to bed for a couple of hours. On this occasion, it was no different. I, I went to bed, and uh, as I snuggled down in bed, a shadow being appeared in the bedroom. Only this time, he looked at me directly, and they don't do that. And uh, and he beckoned me. He just beckoned me like this. And uh, I said, oh, go away. I'm tired. I'll come back later. And he left. He walked through the door, and, uh, and he came back a couple of minutes later, and he beckoned me again. He looked directly at me. And I said, again, go away. I'm tired. Uh, come back later. I'm not interested. Anyway, I came back for a third time, and uh, I, uh, I said, "Oh, you obviously want to show me something, right? I'll come and have a look." So he left. He went through the door. I didn't get dressed. I went out. To, I opened the door, me and myself, and went through the door. And there on the door was a column of light, a beam of light from the floor to the ceiling. And uh, I thought, well, "You've come to all this." Uh, 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 problems to get me to look at this i'll step into the beam of light so i stepped into it and i immediately felt a feeling of euphoria just total euphoria uh, and then uh, a couple of seconds later uh, a voice spoke to me and said uh, i am your father you are your father's son now at that moment in time i wasn't certain who that was i thought it was possibly my deceased father uh, it wasn't it was ra the lead counsel of the anunnaki i know that because he told me that later uh, but uh, uh, that feeling of euphoria uh, lasted. Uh, the light disappeared uh, from the floor to the ceiling and disappeared in my stomach chest area. And I was no longer tired. I got dressed. I got up and that evening. Uh, I told my wife about it and we went out for a meal uh, because I was still full of energy. So the shadow people are here. They are real. Uh, they're just a different level of consciousness that we don't normally see or interact 
uh, unless they want to. But I do know that ETs uh, do use them. But for them to actually look at you directly in the face and beckon you, uh, most unusual. Mm. So you're saying that you believe that they can be intermediaries between the realms because they exist literally in between the realms. Yes, That's interesting. Exactly. There have been so many analysis, so much analysis done on who they may be, what they may be, what they're representing. Uh, some have compared them to what are known in the uh, uh, Islamic faith as the jinn. Of course, having you know a negative connotation in in many cases, uh, or genie meaning they could be helpful. It, it, again, we're looking at a whole range of species of entity, not just. E.T. as we classically discuss it, but all sorts of non-human intelligence having a whole range of agendas within one species. So interesting. Uh, yes, I think that once you realize that, uh, I think the true life form in the uh, universe is consciousness itself. And consciousness has its different levels. And the, the difference between the levels of consciousness are the vibrational frequencies. And uh, there are yes. all these species and beings at these different levels. I have the ability to uh, uh, raise my vibrational frequency, uh, separate my conscious energy from my physical, and travel outside and then go to those higher levels of consciousness. And, uh, and I've traveled to, to many realms outside of the physical. And I've met many species uh, doing that as well, So and especially Orton D. So, uh, but we're not taught that. We don't understand that. And we need to be educated in relation to consciousness. That's the key thread that they've taught me through my lifelong interaction with them. And I know there are many people now that speak out about it, many of these spiritual people. Uh, but what we really need to do now is educate the people who are not spiritually minded, but uh, are open, open minded to learn about these things. And it opens up the reality. And then once we realize that, our own thoughts and consciousness together create the reality that we live in, then we can co-create uh, with each other or co-create with our ETs, and they're here to assist with that, to create that new rea reality that we, as I said before, desire for our children, for our future generations. And that reality will include the ETs. It will be the norm. And that's where we're heading now, and, and not too far in the distant future, I'm sure. I agree with you. This idea of consciousness, I've heard you speak so much about it. And I think I, I may be paraphrasing a bit, but you said once said, it's amazing how much you can travel by consciousness alone. This, I, I would imagine, is connected into your travels in the out of body state. And I want to spend a few minutes on that as well. Out of body experience. Do, what do you feel came first? Your propensity to have out of body travel? and then connecting with the ET realm, or did your interaction with the ET realm sort of open up your ability to travel out of your body? I think what a little bit of both. We mentioned when I was three years old, and uh, I always had the feeling that my consciousness was in like a suit, and it was mm -hmm. always looking out. It was like two. I had my physical, and, and, and that, that was most of my childhood. And then at nine years old, um, art appeared in uh, my home behind the curtains was a conscious energy orb four to six inches across slightly vibrating we had no communication that i was aware of and at that time i didn't know it was art but that was his pure conscious energy separated from his physical and uh, but when he left after the week he'd stayed there i was able to leave my body at will and I would just use it locally. I'd go and visit my grandparents who lived about 70 miles away. i just relax, open my mind, uh, take my conscious energy over there into their home. And I would sit upstairs looking down through the opaque floor and uh, visit with my grandparents. And I always wondered what they would see if they came upstairs. And I now know the answer to that. They would have seen my pure conscious energy. And it would have been an orb, four to six inches across, uh, yellow, golden in colour, and slightly vibrating. So uh, we we all, I'm sure we all have that ability, but sure. I'm, I think art uh, either uh, activated some DNA, or, and, and later on, he, he did say to me that, uh, why don't I use the ability to travel further? Well, I used to use it, as I say, to visit my grandparents. Then when I got older, I would go and uh, just 
nip outside of my body, as it were, to see if my friends were home before I walked around to see if they wanted to go out for the evening <laughs> because we didn't have phones or anything then. So I would use it as another sense. And I thought that was quite normal. And clearly it wasn't. And now I've got the ability I can travel anywhere. I can create things with it, as our ET star families do as well. So right. uh, I have a story where I was traveling on the astral plane and Ot D came alongside me in a craft and the craft was conscious that they'd created. So I'm traveling outside the craft and they invited me on the craft. Uh, they wanted me to convey a message for somebody, which I did do. I, I mean, I've met them many times on that way, but on this particular occasion, I said, look, let me see if I understand this, if I have this correct. Here we are, we've got three different species, uh, three different people, traveling as pure conscious energy uh, in a conscious craft that's been created by you uh, on the astral plane. They said, uh, yes, that's correct. And I said, I see you as pure conscious energy orbs. And I described them, how do you see me? And they said, Kevin, we see you exactly the same. The same. So we have the abilities that they have, only we don't know it and we're not taught it. Uh, and yeah, I'm sure you can learn all these abilities and you can activate your DNA uh, and there's many ways of activating it. I think it's necessary that we begin the process of learning these modalities. This is one of the things that I'm getting very strongly, Kevin, about the significance of these times. It seems as if our quote unquote freedoms and the, the things that we felt uh, is didn't even give a second thought to doing like travel and uh, re not reading other people's minds, but certainly communicating non-verbally. Uh, we, take, we take for granted that we can do uh, you know, communicate at any time, travel wherever we want. It could be that some of these things that we interpret as our freedoms being taken away may be forcing us to kick in the abilities that we won't even need these tools anymore. We won't need to get on a plane anymore. Maybe that I've, you know, listen, I've really given this some serious thought that maybe we are really being pushed to start to uh, take these things uh, out of being atrophied, dormant. We have the ability, I believe, to communicate mind to mind. We have the ability to leave our body and go wherever we want and physically perhaps be in another location. I know people that have claimed to have done that. It's, yeah. it's, it's very interesting, the timing of all that's going on right now, people like yourself coming forward to talk about very casually. You're, you're speaking to us very as if, I'm not gonna say you're saying, oh, no big deal. It is a big deal. It's a big deal because it's still there's still an area of unfamiliarity uh, to to many of us, but it's a very real phenomenon. Do you feel that they may be trying to utilize you as a catalyst to tell the rest of the world, let's practice this all together? Have you thought about helping other people obtain out of body um, travel? Have you I, haven't, I haven't really. No, I I did help one person. She was a doctor, and she was trying to travel uh, out of her body. And uh, if I if I can explain just exactly how I do it myself. Uh, and uh, very many men have done this for me in a child. I look inward and I like it looking inward and inward and inward. And then until I get to a point where I see like an eye. And then when I see the eye, I change direction and move forward, go through the eye. And when you see all these stars and things, uh, um, that's when you're on an astral plane. And this particular, particular lady, she got to the point where she sees the eye, but she didn't go through the eye because she was frightened of getting back. And I said, well, I've been traveling this way all my life from a child, and you, you come back. It's quite normal to come back. And I met another lady uh, very similar, and I gave her the same information. But no, I don't think I'm here to teach people. I think I'm just here to – well, they tell me what I'm here for to do. They want me to share my uh, um, information, uh, mm -hmm. want me to share my story. And uh, how that came about a few years ago, because I hadn't spoken about it to anybody – uh, a few years ago, I'd got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, and uh, I came back from the bathroom. There's a bright light outside the window. The light came into the bedroom. The bedroom lit up like a myriad of butterflies, and then Orton D materialized at the bottom of the bed. After pleasantries, I asked what was the reason for their visit, and that's when they asked me to write about my lifelong experiences with them mm -hmm. and to talk about them. And I remember saying to Ort, I said, I don't mind uh, uh, talking about them, but I'm not a writer. And they said, well, we will continue to guide you. We will continue to teach you. In fact, you will write two books, Kevin, and, uh, and we will give you information to include in the books. 
uh, which they have done and have now written the two books, uh, Spiritual Consciousness, A Personal Journey, and a co-authored book with uh, Melissa Kennedy and Edgar Yo calling Tap Into Universal Energy. So uh, they were correct in that, but, but I'm happy speaking about it. But uh, the next part of my uh, mission, as, it's, as we say, uh, is to help facilitate what they call the reveal. And that's what I'm working on now towards. Uh, so, again, I don't think I'm here as a teacher per se. I'm happy sharing the knowledge and information they've given me. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I don't feel that I need to stand in front of a large group and lecture uh, about consciousness or anything like that. Uh, that What I did say to them, I, I did say, uh, but if I start talking about it, my experiences with you, people won't believe me. They said, Kevin, it doesn't matter whether they believe you. What's important is you tell the story, uh, mm -hmm. the stories of the interactions. So that's what I do. And I do find that it opens up doors. And I've met many others now, like me, uh, maybe not quite to the extent of my abilities, but very, very close. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, they're, they're guiding I, many people. I don't think that it's necessary for one to believe or not believe. Remember, so much information is taken on a subconscious level that even if there's this temptation to not want to hear, whatever is resonating is coming in at the subconscious level, it's still very well maybe having an effect. So I can understand that they're they're being persistent and having you share your message to whatever degree in this wonderful book, Spiritual Consciousness. We'll make sure to put up an image of the book in post. But, um, oh gosh, there's still so many things we didn't cover. But I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go over to the Patreon after show where you and I are going to continue the conversation. You know what we're going to talk about, Journeyers? We're going to talk about the message that he got about uh, the possibility that the Council of Eight will be meeting with the United Nations. That's what we're going to talk about. Can we share? Can we share that scoop with our with our Patreon membership? Because that's pretty big, and I yes, know that. It's fun. Yes, it's, I've no secrets. I'm happy to share anything that they've given me, any information, and uh, okay. that's why I'm here. You know, so I'm happy. Uh, uh, I'm out there in the open. I'm so glad you're here. Well, we're going to take that conversation because that, in and of itself, is a is a loaded one. Yes, we're talking about a possible uh, meeting between alien intelligence and the UN. I want to hear what they told you. I want our audience to hear over on Patreon what they said to you. And I most importantly want to find out, did something happen? Who knows? Okay. Let's see. Well, okay. That let sounds... me uh, tell you how I got the information first. We're not going to do it right now, though. We're going to oh, do okay. it. <laughs> We're leaving that for the after We're show. We're out. leaving We're that for out. the after show. We're going yes. to a different room. <laughs> We're going to. That's exactly right. We're going to a different room. Oh, gosh. And we are going to have you back because there's still so many things. I really would love to have a conversation about uh, your insights, the downloads that you got on the, the the mechanics of the quantum reality, of subatomic reality, and how it relates to uh, what we call the reality that we we regularly navigate, as well as more information on consciousness and frequency, because I know there's a lot, a lot there. Um but is there anything you'd like to leave our audience with in terms of particularly speaking to other experiencers out there that may be afraid to come forward to share their experiences? What would you say to them? Well, I would say reach out to the different experiencer groups, and there are many out there. Uh, you mm -hmm. can contact me at, on my uh, email, which is just kevinjamesbriggs at gmail.com, or you can go onto my uh, uh, website, which is kevinjbriggs.com. Uh, uh, I contact me either way and I can introduce you to some experiencer groups in your area. Uh, uh, and if I can assist in any way, uh, then I will. Just reach out to me. That is great. Thank you for that. There are so many that I hear from, so many of you that I hear from, that Kevin, in spite of all the wonderful voices like yourself coming forward, still feel alone. I don't know how many times I can say it. You're, you're not alone. Now, I know that the experiences are very subjective and they're very tailored to you. That could make you feel alone. It does feel like a lonely journey at times. But for, for people like yourself and your friend Kathleen Martin, who we've had on the show several times as well, that are doing amazing work, that are there for you, who, are, who feel you may be having experiences to try to unpack what they are, what to do with them, what we do with them. There's still lots of questions people like Kevin are here to help. So for that, I thank you so much as this fly is 
wanting to land on me. How funny. Fly landing on me. Okay. Anyway, we're going to go on over to the end. He's saying, come on, Alexis, it's time to go to the next door, the after show. But before we do, thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, for gracing us with your presence. I want to give a quick, uh, quick message for next week. Do you know the work of David Adair? They call him the original rocket man, David Adair. Kevin, are you familiar with David's work? No, no, no. He is going to give us the lowdown on, we didn't cover the disclosure uh, subject today, although I think we may touch on that in the after show. But uh, David Adair, for those of you uh, who are familiar with his work, know that he's stayed on the cutting edge of, of intelligence in terms of understanding what may be really going on behind the Iron Curtain. He'll be our guest next week on Higher Journeys. Uh, and we'll, he's going to give us his take on what is really happening with the UAP task force report that seemed like it was more or less of a non-report. But let's see what uh, his take is on all of that. So that's about it for now. Kevin, again, thank you. Don't go anywhere. We're going to go next door. Folks, I appreciate you. Come on over, support us on Patreon now more than ever because of the particularly what we're trying to do with the QHHT scholarship. We want to be able to award scholarships to our uh to deserving individuals who want to take the training. That's what we're really gunning for here. So coming over to Patreon and supporting higher journeys, yes, that's a great thing, but let's make this scholarship campaign happen. I'll be bringing it up every single show. We've got to reach this milestone. So that being said, we will talk to you soon. Kevin, thank you, my dear. And well, thank uh, we'll you. see thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Great story. Oh my God. Wow. All right, guys, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.